everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with you uh, and to join with you in approaching the house of the Lord. And it's such an encouragement, certainly for me, to be here with you and to come to the Lord with you. And that's exactly what we're looking at as we consider our uh, order of worship this morning. We are approaching God in response to his call to us to come to him. He's always calling us to draw near to him. So follow along with me and respond where it does say people. And, and this call to worship comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Allow me to pray, and then we'll sing together. Almighty God, we do ask that you would receive us into your holy place, not because we deserve it, Lord, but because we come in and through the only true one who genuinely has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to what is false and has not sworn deceitfully. Our Lord Jesus, who stands before you, and we piggyback, as it were, upon Jesus and come into your presence because of his beautiful holiness and righteousness. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we come before you, that that declaration over our lives, that we have been justified by faith in Jesus, would become increasingly an actualized reality in our lives, that you would purify us and sanctify us from the heart, that you would change us and make us more like your Son, through whom we come before you this morning. We pray, Holy Father, that in your presence you would deal with us where we are, Lord. Where we need to be comforted, you would comfort us. Where we need to be challenged, you, you would challenge us. Where we need to be confronted and changed, we pray that you would do so, Lord. Do this work in our lives, we pray, through your word, by your spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's ask that the Lord, by his spirit, would open the eyes of our hearts. Let's stand and sing together. Open 
Amen. Please be seated. Our service order is a little bit different today. We will have a time of confessing sins, but it will come after uh, the exposition of the scriptures. So allow me to use this time to welcome you once again to Cornerstone Church. It is great to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Pastor Sam. San Lago, and I'm happy to be with you and lead you in this time of worship. And if you're joining us on, on Facebook Live, you're very welcome as well. And please be sure to hit that share button and get this message out to as many people as you can. You can click on the share button just below. Uh, if you can, please turn with me in your notice board uh, to the announcements. You'll have a, a little outline. This is for the sermon. Uh, hold on to that, that'll help you follow along. If I get too lost, go down some sort of bunny trail, you can hold on to this and like, hang on to this for your life. And also fill that out with whatever you think is, is necessary that you want to highlight in the sermon. Uh, the, the welcome sheet has the ongoing events and activities of the church. Uh, keep uh, an eye on that, take that home with you. Uh, use this little um, rectangle on the side there to pray for the members of the church. Uh, I hope that we would be the house of God, a house of prayer, as Jesus said, was an expectation from Isaiah that the new, the new people of God would be. So let's be in prayer for one another. Um, we have a couple announcements or a couple things I want to highlight, but all, all of what's on here is important. Uh, first is that we have a new Sunday school class. Um, I found it fun. Maybe maybe everyone else hasn't found it so fun. We'll see. But um, we are we are leading. I am leading a interactive Bible study through the Gospel of Mark as we go through the Gospel of Mark in uh, our times of, of worship. We're studying the Gospel of Mark, but it's, we're trying to do it in such a way that it's interactive and that we're all actively participating in reading, studying, and understanding the scriptures for ourselves. And really about acquiring tools to better read the Bible for ourselves. So hopefully, hopefully that's, that's been the case, and, uh, and we will get uh, deeper and deeper into Mark as we go forward. That should last about another two to three months. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. It doesn't matter that you're joining us on the third, fourth, eighth class, and that's the earliest you can join us in. Just join us, and we'll walk through what it means to read the scriptures together. Okay, you're always welcome. The other thing I want to highlight is um, I'd love to visit people um, uh, as soon as possible, especially those of you who have been housebound and maybe haven't been able to come out to Sunday or haven't had a chance for me to, to chat to me, talk to me yet. Um, I'm supposed to be fully inoculated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine by now, so hopefully that makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. If you would like me to stop by and see you at home, uh, please write or call Eldeny at the church office, and she will set up an appointment for you with me. If you've been away for a long time and haven't had the opportunity to, to participate in Holy Communion, in the Lord's Supper, uh, during this time, uh, let Eldeny know, and we'll try to schedule uh, a visit, not only with myself, but also the elders, so that we can have a, a brief uh, Lord's Supper service with you, and, and uh, share that with you. Uh, and uh, as always, let's continue to be praying for one another. Uh, there are ongoing activities. There are ongoing health concerns. Uh, please be praying for that. Uh, we, as a, as a session, the elders of this church, we're meeting now every week. Um, and we're meeting every week uh, to really spend time reading through a book together, uh, praying together, and thinking together about uh, the present and the future of Cornerstone Church. So we really could use your prayers. We don't have all the answers. We, we're not sure what, what God is calling us to do at this hour. But we believe that God is good, that he has good plans for this church. And so we want to work together to discern uh, what God is calling us to do in this new season of Cornerstone's life. Uh, so we need prayer. We need help from God. We need help from the Holy Spirit. So if you could be praying for us uh, to that end, we would really appreciate it. Am I forgetting anything at this time? Anything that should be highlighted? All right, um, let's take a moment to pray and prepare our hearts and minds for God and his word. Yes. 
Heavenly Father, we ask you now that you would, as we've just sung, you would hear this song as a genuine prayer of our hearts. That you would open the eyes of all of our hearts, Lord. That we would see the wondrous truths in your word. That we would see you high and lifted up. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, in your mercy, in your kindness, that you would indeed pour out your power and love. And that you would lead us to sing and to acknowledge that you are holy, holy. Father, I pray that your spirit would take over and that your spirit would minister your word to all of our hearts. Father, I pray that you would speak to all of us, myself included, this morning. And that you would call us to this radical call to a life dedicated to you, to sharing your message centered on you, and to, a, to live a life surrendered to you. But Father, I pray that we would see revival in our time, in our own hearts, in our church, in our, in our city, and in our nation. Have mercy on us, we pray. In Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Friends, turn with me if you can to Isaiah chapter 1. We will be looking, reading briefly out of Isaiah Malachi this morning, but we will not be spending a lot of time studying there. But this is some of the background especially in terms of the themes that we find today in Mark. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. And through Isaiah, we really hear God, Yahweh, speak to the people of Israel. So hear the word of the Lord. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before, your, before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And the second reading is found in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is your last book in the Old Testament. If you need some help, if you get to Matthew, just turn left. It will be in Malachi chapter 4. <clears throat> Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. These are the last words of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, and before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest they come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, this might seem like a strange sermon title for a passage speaking of the very beginning of the gospel and speaking of the ministry of John the Baptist. But I hope I can, I can demonstrate from the scriptures that there is good reason to speak of this. Uh, I want to suggest that one of the main themes in this, in this section, verses 4 to 8 in Mark, is God revives his people. I will read it in just a moment, but I want you to read it carefully and consider that with me. So, let's, let's hear the reading of the Gospel of Mark, the reading that we will examine this morning. We are continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Hear the word of the Lord. John, John appeared 
baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Cornerstone Church, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. I want to say something to you that I hope is of encouragement to you, but I also hope that it is something that will fuel, as it were, a hunger for God, which is that God revives his people. God delights to revive his people. And I believe that in these verses we have a brief snapshot, a quick image, a little trailer of revival. Uh, maybe not revival exactly as we know it uh, from the day of Pentecost on and other moments of revival throughout the history of the, you could say, the New Testament church, the universal church. But it's certainly a picture that reflects some of the revivals that you see that come out of the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 20 with Jehoshaphat and Second Chronicles 30 with Hezekiah, moments of great national uh, transformation, uh, moments of darkness in which a leader arises by God and calls the people of God in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, to turn back to God, to, to forsake their rebellion against God, their resistance towards God, their, their stubbornness towards God, and to turn back to God, in which the call is actually responded to. In, in for example, 2 Chronicles 20, and then later in 2 Chronicles 30, we see that there is largely a national renewal of commitment, of, uh, of desire for holiness, of, of whole commitment to God, a repentance of sin, and the experience of God blessing and healing His people. And this is special because it's actually, it's actually very rare in the history of Israel, and it seems like it's increasingly rare the later you get into the history of Israel before the coming of Jesus. It seems like the further back you go, even though they go through horrendous experiences, it seems like the further away, at least from the heart, are the people of God. They're, they're away from the Lord. They, they experience moments of political success, of national success with Nehemiah and Ezra, but not largely of spiritual success. It's interesting, if you know something of the story of the Old Testament, uh, though with Nehemiah and Ezra, this is when the people of God, uh, the, the people of the southern kingdom at least, come back from uh, exile in Babylon. They rebuild the walls, they begin to rebuild the temple, but actually the way the stories end is with a sense that spiritually the people are still not right with God. And actually Nehemiah seems to describe his ministry as ultimately, from a spiritual perspective, one of failure, not of success. That's why we can't underestimate, in a sense, how quote-unquote successful and powerful John the Baptist's ministry is. Uh, uh, Jesus says there has been none greater since the, the law of the prophets in John. And it's summarized for us in Mark chapter 1, verse 5. Look at it with me, please, where it says, And all the country... Uh, I want to, sorry, let me pause. Excuse me. Uh, apologize. Here comes John the Baptist, and we're told in verse 4, he's coming out of the wilderness, this strange hermit character, this wild man from the desert, comes out, and he preaches a message which says, you guys all stink. It's the opposite of the messages we hear today. The messages that we hear today is, you're wonderful, you're great, everything about you is amazing. You just have to realize how beautiful and amazing you are, and reach the potential that is already inside of you. And those, those messages grow huge audiences. And John comes out and says, you guys stink. You guys are the worst. You guys got to change. Everything about you is wrong. Change. Repent. Come and be baptized in repentance. 
And this is the sign that something very powerfully spiritual is happening all of the region. Notice how many times Mark says, all, oh, and all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem, the capital city, were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river, confessing the sins. Uh, John is at the Jordan, and the Jordan is not that near to Jerusalem. This is a long trek. People were going a long time, probably traveling for days and days and days, to hear a guy tell them how terrible they are. And yet Mark describes it as all the country, and all of Jerusalem are going through this, and willingly going to this man. That's a miracle. We, we, don't, we don't like to hear messages like that. The fact that all the region, all of the city are going out to John the Baptist is because something powerful is happening. Something supernatural is going on. <coughs> now, it's, it's hyperbolic language. Mark does not mean to say that literally every single individual without exception went down to confess the sins and were baptized. Because we know from other gospels that there were some people who opposed John. But he's trying to say, it's a huge crowd that responds to John. And they are confessing their sins, and they're being baptized. And what's interesting is the word going out to him, it, it, you can see it in the English, but it's even more explicit in the Greek, is they were going out to him continually. People went out, confessed their sins, were baptized, would go back to their home country, or not home country, hometown or city, and then go back out to hear John preach to them. They go back, and go back out to hear John preach. I mean, people went back and forth, back and forth. They wanted to hear this guy say what he had to say. There's something about, there's something about the message of calling them to repent of their sins, to be sorry for their lifestyle, and a call to have a radical change in their lifestyle oriented towards God that actually affected them positively. I don't think people were gluttons for punishment back then any more than they are now. It's that they somehow found liberty and something joyful and something positive and something hopeful in this message. Something powerful is happening. We know that as a result of this, it, from, from, from these people who end up following, some of them dedicated themselves to following John and actually living with him and so on. We know that from that pool, Jesus, Jesus would ultimately draw a lot of his disciples. And later, Paul is traveling halfway across the Roman Empire, arrives in the city of Ephesus, and finds disciples of John the Baptist there, decades, this is decades later. And, he, and, he, and they preach the gospel to them, and they become the basis for the Ephesian church. The ministry of John cannot be underestimated. And his ministry is one of revival, calling people to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Coming of the Lord. And so I want to suggest to you that we see in what's happening here a type of uh, pattern. Though, though we are different from John, though we're not in the situation that John was in, though we're in a different context, a pattern as to how God delights to bring revival to his people. And he does so, first of all, through people consecrated to him, dedicated to him, absolutely set apart to him. And we see this in the person of John, and we see this in two principal ways. One is in the way that John the Baptist is dressed. He's dressed in a weird way. Look at verse 6 with me. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, Mark almost never describes the way someone is dressed. So if he's describing the way someone is dressed, it's because he really wants to highlight the way someone is dressed. He's, he says practically nothing of Jesus' appearance. You'd think that he would want you know, to describe the way Jesus is. He describes nothing. But he spends a section describing how John is, is dressed. And, and, and for us, it's really weird. For us, it's a really weird. This, we could just imagine this wild-haired guy with his camel's clothes and this bell, and he's eating locusts and honey in the desert, and it kind of puts us off. This, this is a bit of a, this guy seems a little creepy, actually, a little weird. Um, but though it's strange for us, it would have not necessarily, it would have been unusual, perhaps, for the people of the first century, the Jewish people, but not completely out of their purview. It got completely off the radar. A scholar, Thomas Yoder Newfield, summarizes this best when he says, John's unusual behavior, appearance, and message were not seen as evidence of craziness by his contemporaries. They are intelligible, understandable. 
within the long history of the Jewish people as quote unquote the normal, quote unquote the normal, eccentricities of divine messengers. Many of the Old Testament prophets had dressed and behaved in similar ways. One of the most, one of the most famous was Elijah. And, and we just read the last verses of the Old Testament that speak of the return of Elijah. And, his, and with the return of Elijah would come a message that would turn fathers' hearts back to the children, children's hearts back to their, their fathers, a message of repentance, a message of reconciliation, a message of reunion, a, a, a message of, of restoring peace between parties. And that's what characterizes John's ministry. Mark is trying to tell us this John is the Elijah. Now we know from other passages that John himself would say, I'm not Elijah. But the point is not that he is individually Elijah floating back down from heaven, you know, coming back down on his chariot of fire, you know the story of Elijah, but rather he comes in Elijah's spirit, as it were. He picks up Elijah's mantle, as it were. He, he carries on the Elijah ministry. If you know something of the history of Elijah's ministry, he was a prophet, a, a fiery prophet, in a dark context where the people of God are in deep rebellion against God, they're, they're worshiping other gods, they want nothing to do with, with God, they're in deep rebellion, and God sends him to be a confrontational figure, a wild confrontational prophet. And John the Baptist kind of takes on that message, but his message actually resonates and provokes the response that Elijah would have wished his message had provoked. You know, Elijah almost ends his ministry in depression out in a cave, uh, in, in fear for his life and, and sure that his, his, his ministry had failed. And God reassures him that it had not. But, but you don't get the crowds with Elijah that you get with John. You really see John carrying it through. So John's appearance identifies him as a prophet. John's appearance identifies him as Elijah come back. John, John's appearance actually confirmed the expectation that people had that before Messiah came, before the Lord would come, uh, uh, another Elijah-like figure would appear. A man dedicated to God, out in the desert, completely devoted to pursuing God in his life. And that takes us to the second element. It's, there's John's significant uh, 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 dress, but there's also John's significant dwelling. John lives in the wilderness. We know from the Gospel of John that he lives in the desert. And the wilderness or the desert in the Old Testament is the place where people went out to meet with God. You know, from Moses, for example, to, well, frankly, Elijah himself, the, the, the wilderness is a place of danger, of peril, of temptation, but also the place where people encounter God and were often called by God and then commissioned by God. And so John is wearing the dress of a prophet. He's living in the habitation of a prophet, of a man that's dedicated to God, who's depending on God's provision. And, we, and it's interesting because it is in the person of John, as we saw last week and we're seeing today, that God is fulfilling his promise. His herald is coming because God's king is coming, the Messiah is coming. Now why is all that important for us? What does that have to do with us? Other than a neat historical description, why is this relevant for us? I want to suggest the following. John the Baptist had a call from God. To proclaim a message designed to call people to prepare themselves for the coming of the Messiah. And the Messiah came, and we'll see that the Messiah was Jesus, and Jesus lived his life and carried out a, a ministry and taught, and ultimately was rejected and humiliated and killed and buried, and then raised against a new life and ascended into heaven. And, and then the message is he's going to come again. Just as the Lord was coming back then, so the Lord has accomplished his mission. But has ascended, and now is, there's a message and a promise of him coming again. The Lord will come again. And so, on the one hand, our situation is totally different from the time of John's. We have infinitely more information and truth, and there's the Holy Spirit has been poured out, and we know who, who the Messiah is. It's Jesus, and the gospel has been done, and he, Jesus has died on the cross for our sins, and, and we're in a much better place. In a very different place, but in another sense, we're in a very similar place. We are also a people awaiting the coming of their king. We're also people who have a call from God to prepare the world for his coming. Jesus, we know from the rest of the Bible, 
He's coming again with the kingdom to cons with, for the consummation of the kingdom, for the full expression, full manifestation of the kingdom of God. And in the meantime, he calls on his people to seek to be renewed and revived in the truth of the gospel, in the power of the Spirit. We are told to be prepared for his coming and to prepare others for his coming. You know, the Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus, this is probably decades after the, the events of the Gospel. He's uh, writing to Christians in Rome, and in Romans chapter 13, 11 and 12, Paul writes this. You know the time, and he's writing to Christians, Christians in Rome. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. You had sleepy Christians in the first century. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now, a reference to the second coming of Jesus, than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. Let me ask you something. Salvation in the form of Jesus' second coming was at hand 2,000 years ago. Then how much closer is it now? John the Apostle writes to a church and says, My children, we are in the last hour. 2,000 years ago was the last hour. So my guess, to quote an evangelist, we're in the last second of the last minute of the last hour. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Are we aware of the fact that the Lord is coming? In the first century, Paul has to say, wake up. You're falling asleep. Our salvation is nearer now than it was when we first believed. How is that not true right now for us? But my suspicion is that the church is asleep at the wheel. We are not the way. You can see it in the way that we behave. You can see it in the absolute zero, almost, discernible, positive, positive effect that we have in the world around us. You can see it in the way that we make decisions and live our lives. There's no sense of the urgency and the nearness of the coming of Christ. Christ is coming back in 5,000 years as far as we are concerned. There's no urgency to the reality of the gospel and to the people around us. There's no, there's no change in our lives. There's no change in our consuming habits and what we watch on television and the way we behave in the, in the way that we think and feel in our longing for God. We're completely consumed with entertainment and politics and materialism and consumption of our own lives. I think the scriptures tell us that we're called to be messengers who are here to prepare for Christ's coming. We're called to be a people through whom God therefore brings revival and renewal. And we do so by being like John the Baptist, a people consecrated to him. Now, let me be clear. I don't mean that we have to therefore sell our goods, go into some desert, you know, cease to use shampoo, you know, keep one set of clothing that we wear out to tatters. Because, you know, Jesus, it's interesting, Jesus in some ways, you know, if you read Jesus, you know, John is proclaiming the message of repentance, and then you go down to verse 15, when Jesus shows up, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus, in many ways, takes up the mantle of John the Baptist's ministry. He takes it much further, but it's not a totally different ministry. He, he's continuing along the same trajectory as John. But whereas John is seen as an ascetic and as a hermit and someone kind of far off from crazy, Jesus is surrounded with people. And Jesus delights to go to parties, so much so that he is falsely accused of being a glutton and a drunk, but he's falsely accused on the basis of the truth that he ate and he drank. And he enjoyed company, and he went to people's homes, and he was a figure much more concerned with celebration. In fact, John the Baptist, people ask him, how come you're Jesus? How come your disciples eat 
and enjoy life in a way that John the Baptist's disciples don't. They, they fast, and your disciples don't fast. And he says, the bridegroom is with them. <coughs> himself. So it's not time, it's not time for them to fast. Later, the bridegroom will be taken away and they will fast. But so, so Jesus is not this, this kind of crazy looking ascetic figure. And yet, who can deny that there's no one more consecrated to God than Jesus Christ? The point is that our hearts have to, must be John the Baptist hearts, hearts that are dedicated to Christ, centered on Jesus, whose lives revolve about the, around the priority of the kingdom of God in a way that is radical, in a way that won't be looked at as weird. We were talking about in the Bible study how John the Baptist is a weird, looks weird to us. If your heart is the John the Baptist heart, the Elijah heart, you will seem weird to those around you. And we need to get comfortable with looking weird. We may not have crazy hair and wear camel skin, but the way that we live will be as weird to people as John the Baptist seems weird to us. Are we comfortable with that? Or would we rather not do that and continue doing what the church has been largely doing for the last few decades in the West? So God revives. That's the amazing message that we find here. He loves to bring revival, to revivify, to bring new life, to, to bring the, the defibrillator to to the chest of his people and shock us back to life, to bring us back to new life, to bring us back to where we've been called to in the first place, but that we've drifted away from. Revival is principally about what God does in the church before what he does out in the world somewhere. And he does, does this through people who are consecrated to him. He does this through a message centered on him. Uh, uh, John's, because he was radically consecrated to God, this message was centered on God, was centered on the Messiah, was ultimately centered on Jesus. And he, he, he centers his message in, on Jesus in three ways. He sees Jesus as the mighty one, Jesus as the Lamb of God, and Jesus as the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 7 with me. After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. He's speaking of Jesus as the master. He's the master and I'm the servant. He's the master and I'm the slave. Uh, John is speaking of Jesus as the king. He is the king. He is the king and I am not even worthy of undoing his, his sandals. He is the king. He centers the message on the king. The kingdom of God is coming and the king of the kingdom of God is Jesus. But the second message that John has is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to borrow from the Gospel of John. Okay, so please forgive me. But in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says this. You read there, John 1, 29. The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I actually don't think, from what we know later on in John the Baptist's life, I don't think he fully understood what he was saying. And that's not... That's how rare. Often in the Bible, prophets say things that they don't fully understand. They don't fully understand what they're saying. I don't know if you fully understood what he's saying, but, but he's saying not only is the Messiah the king, but the Messiah is this sacrificial lamb. The Messiah is actually going to be the scapegoat who gets blamed for our sin. You know, literally the word scapegoat comes from the scriptures. It's an idea that comes from the Bible. That a goat is sent away with our sins, as it were, into the desert, away from us. Takes the sin with him, away from us, into the desert. The, the goat escapes into the desert, and the sin has been put on him. It's an image, it's a picture. A type of sacrament, if you will. But John's saying, he is the scapegoat. He's the lamb that takes away, removes the sin, removes the thing that's caused the problem between mankind and God. He is the one who takes care of it, and he does so by dying like a sacrificial lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one who removes it. So Jesus is the king, but he comes to establish his kingdom, not by trampling on those who are weaker than him, but he comes to establish his kingdom by dying like a sacrificial lamb, is the message of John. 
And finally, and this is in Mark as well, Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And this is obviously, uh, looking ahead, it's a foretaste to what we see in the book of Acts with Pentecost and the ministry of the Holy Spirit ahead of time. But John the Baptist, a, a prophet, looks ahead and he sees Jesus' ministry and identity as king, as sacrificial lamb that deals with our sin, and as baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I mean, he literally says, I come here baptizing with water, but he is so much greater than I, he baptizes in the Holy Spirit. There's John the Baptist, I don't know if you thought about this, and Jesus the Baptist. John baptizes with water, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He's the one who will baptize. Baptize can mean immersion, baptize can mean outpouring on top, it can mean saturation. When, 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 you, when you put a sponge in water and it sucked up all the water, that was baptism. Baptism can mean smear. It, it's just it's saturation with something. It's being immersed in something. It's being it's having something poured out over something. And what, what, what John is saying is, this one will immerse you in God. The Holy Spirit's God. Will immerse you in God. This one will pour out God, as it were, on you. He will dunk you and he will be absorbing God like a sponge in a bucket. He is going to do this in you. This is the great theme that comes from the Old Testament, the idea that God would indwell man. Uh, Tozer has a book on this. Uh, man, man, the dwelling place of God. It speaks of, of incredible intimacy with God. But the idea is that, is that Christ baptizes in the Holy Spirit pours out the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit flows out through us into the world. Remember that Jesus in a different place says that we could come and drink of him? And the one who goes to drink of him himself will become rivers of living water? And this is imagery from the Old Testament. Ezekiel, for example, speaks of God building a new temple out of which would flow a river, and this river would flow into a desert. And this river would flow into a desert, and the desert would become a tropical oasis as the water flows out of the temple. And Jesus is saying, I am that temple. And water flows out from me to you and from, through you into the world. And the world is a dead place, a desert place. But as the water flows, life. Is it any, is it any surprise that the, the Apostle Paul would say, the spirit of life. He is the one who brings life. And Christians are the ones who are described as those who are baptized in the spirit of life. Does the church of God look like a people baptized in God? Or are we baptized in something else? God loves to be revived. He does so through people consecrated to God. Through a message centered on God. John the Baptist keeps pointing away from himself to Jesus. At one point in the Gospel of John, he says, I must decrease that he increase. The Apostle Paul says, we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ. Or elsewhere he says, I knew nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Or in Philippians he says, I want to know nothing but Christ and the power of his resurrection. These are people obsessed with Christ. And baptism in the Holy Spirit is what he does. In Acts 1, verses 1 to 2, we read Luke. Luke writes the Gospel of Luke, and Luke writes the book of Acts. And the preface, the introduction, the prologue of the book of Acts, he says, in the first book, my Gospel, Luke says, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day of sickening up. Implying that in the second book, I will write about what Jesus continued to do and teach. And what's Jesus' ministry if he has been he is the king and he's been sacrificed as a lamb? If not, the baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit so desperately. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, Sam, he fulfilled his ministry as the baptized in the Holy Spirit. He did so in, in Pentecost. So in Acts 2, he baptized all the believers in the upper room with the Holy Spirit. And there you go. Well, that's that's it. And Martin Lloyd Jones. 
Reformed preacher at Westminster Chapel in London. I had the privilege of going there about a year or two ago, and it's about two blocks away from Buckingham Palace, if you've ever been there. Amazing place. He highlights, oh, that's interesting, because those same disciples, the exact same ones who were baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, are then baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts 4. Do you remember this? Then the Samaritans, who trust in Jesus and the Gospel, are baptized in the Spirit in chapter 8. Then, G then Paul, after believing in Christ in the, in the Damascus Road, is prayed for by Ananias and is baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then in chapter 10, congruently with their faith, Cornelius and his family are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then in Ephesians 19, the converts through Paul are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's happening right through the book of Acts. In Galatians 3, 5, Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul writes about Jesus as the one who supplies present continuous, continuous tense, the Spirit to you. The one who is continually supplying the Holy Spirit, who is always willing and ready to pour out His Spirit afresh upon you. And that is the continuing work of Jesus throughout history. That's how He has continually moved the church forward. The church keeps moving forward in periods of revival, of renewal by means of the Holy Spirit, which is the sovereign work of Christ. His sovereign director, directive as king, as captain in the kingdom. Martin Lloyd-Jones, again, wrote toward the very end of his life, he wrote this, and this moves me deeply. He says, the need today, he wrote this in the 70s, by the way. He wrote this, he wrote this 50 years ago. He says, the need today is for an authentication of God, of the supernatural, of the spiritual, of the eternal, and this can only be answered by God graciously hearing our cry and shedding forth again His Spirit upon us as He kept filling the early church. God has gone on filling the church in the life. And this is how He ends. That is the greatest need of the church and our only hope. Some people have a major issue with Marlon Jones at this point. You say, oh, I like Marlon Jones, except when he talks about this stuff. Except that if you take this stuff out of Marlon Jones, you haven't understood Marlon Jones at all. He says, it is the greatest need. It is the only hope of the church. I don't think you can take Marlon Jones without taking that. And it happens finally through a surrender to Jesus. A surrender through a call that is a call to surrender to Jesus. There is no revival without it coming to you, without it striking your heart, without it impacting you. There's no revival in the abstract. It's not something that is talked about and is contemplated at and looked at like a pain. Revival has to become real and has to hit us in the heart. It has to strike us between the eyes. We need to believe that we need to be revived. Not that revival needs to happen out there somewhere. Not that revival has to happen in the Western church, like an abstract concept. The message comes to us. John preached a message of repentance, uh, 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 a message of repentance for forgiveness of sins, expressed in baptism. But then individual people have to hear it and actually confess their sins and be baptized. There's no revival if there's no response from each and every one of us. There is no fresh outpouring of the Spirit without us acknowledging our desperate need for Him. Revival history has never come as people just, you know, gradually and, and gladly went through life and ministry and then, oh, oh, revival came. I didn't see that coming. It always happens in dark times and it always happens through a desperate church. It always happens through people on their knees crying out to God, sometimes for years. There was a revival in, the, in 1859 that began in New York, in Wall Street. A man went to another church. Lunchtime began to pray with just two or three of his buddies. Then the market crashed, and suddenly the church began to fill with prayer. And then other churches had to be opened up. Lunchtime, one hour, just prayer. Just prayer. Let's just meet to pray. People came, began, began to come to Christ in faith just through going to these prayer meetings. And what began to happen is... Uh, 
men began to get off, sailors began to get off from boats. They were coming in to the port from sea. And they would come on to, off onto land and say, where is the nearest church? Where is the nearest minister? I need to receive Christ. I need to receive assurance of forgiveness. And they'd say, well, where's this coming from? Well, these sailors coming off these boats, you know, sailors coming off boats at ports. They're not looking for ministers. They're not looking for the gospel. And they said, no, we were... 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 miles out at sea, and just the conviction of sin came upon us out of nowhere. And we cried out to God and realized that we needed forgiveness out at sea, while in parallel, on land, these men are praying. The Lord of Jones himself again says, God can do in revival in one hour where, what we can do in 50 or 100 years. It is a supernatural act of God. It is the demonstration of our faith that he is the sovereign God who calls his people to salvation. But we don't live as if we believe that. We live as if it depended on our techniques and structures and styles. We live as if it depended on our plans and strategies. We live as if it's necessary somewhere else and not in my own heart. I'll quote Lord Jones one last time to close. It is believers who are revived. Well, we have all the time. Yeah, I'm not sure you got it. It is believers who are revived. Revival means a revivifying. The church has lost her power and is given power again. He, Jesus, gave her the power at the beginning. And he goes on repeating this. That is revival. And God, I say again, has kept his church alive and going by this succession of revivals throughout the centuries. And again, he says, there is nothing more urgently important than this. God loves to bring revival, but he does so through people who are consecrated to him, who are hungry for him, who are pursuing him. He does so through a message centered on his son, Jesus Christ, the king, the Lamb, and the baptizing of the Holy Spirit. But he does so through a call to surrender to this message. So let's take a moment now in our service. This is why we've had this time of confession at the end today. We come to a time of confessing our need of God. As you read this, think about what you're reading. I encourage you to read it first, individually, in silence alone, and we'll read it together. Take a moment to read it. Friends, let's say together the corporate confession of sin. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you, and we confess that we have been too often forgotten and we are guilty. Sometimes we carry on our minds as if they were their own God, and we fall short of being incredible witness to you. For these things we ask for forgiveness, and we also ask for your strength. Give us pure mind and confidence so that we may make this to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you and build our relationship with you and with those you have given us. Let's take a moment of quiet confession of sin, and then we'll hear God's assurance of his forgiveness and the gospel.
as I read the assurance of pardon from Psalm 51, receive in it a reminder of why repentance is actually a road to true joy. We read in Psalm 51, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The way back to God is through a contrite heart. And in God we find everything that we ever looked for, ever needed. I hope in prayer is that as we sang and prayed at the beginning of the service, that the Lord would open the eyes of our heart. And in so doing, that he would become our entire vision, that he would occupy all that we see. So how appropriate to end this time together by singing together, Be Thou My Vision. You can find it in the Trinity Hymnal, the Rule Red Book, uh, hymn 642, and we'll, we'll sing verses, uh, or sentences 1, 2, and 5. So please stand with me and sing. Simply in his being, be all, all for us. So let's receive God's blessing as we leave this place together. Let's receive his, his spark of revival in all of us, his calling to pursue him and seek him with the assurance that he delights to bring new life to us all through Christ. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.